I'm here with Janae Sacken, and I am so excited to talk to you. I read both your first and your second book, and I've wanted to have you on the podcast since your first book, Behind the Lens, which won so many great awards. Um, I think it won the Hawthorne Prize, Book of the Year from American Writing Awards, Shelf Unbound had you as a notable book of the year. And now that I had a chance to read both the first and the one we're going to talk about today, I totally understand why. I am in awe of your ability to go so in depth into a culture that is not your own and to write about a location which is very hard to write about. Both of these books are set in Afghanistan. So first, let me congratulate you because I can tell that these are a true work of the heart to create a book this beautiful. Thank you so much. A lot of research and a lot of heart, exactly. So let's start with them. Where are you? Where are you joining me from today? I am joining you from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, home of an incredible writing community. Very vibrant. And we have some fabulous roundtable critique groups in Milwaukee, uh, Red Oak Writing and Red Bird Writing. Awesome. Well, during the question, when I ask you about writing advice, I'd love if you told us a little bit more about that, especially for anyone who might be listening is in that area. But let's start with talking about your two novels and feel free if you want to start with the first one and talk about the second one. I mean, it's the same main character, Annie Hawkins Green. Mm -hmm. This book touched me, but also got me like my heart was racing half the way through this book. I was like, I couldn't put it down. Let, let's hear from you. Tell us about books. Um, well, Annie Hawkins Green originally was in a very different book set in Mexico, as a matter of fact, and she was a lawyer for uh, the United Nations investigating the uh, maquiladoras in uh, Ciudad Juarez. And I thought it was a terrific book. I really liked it a great deal. My writing community really liked it. And one person... Uh, whom I respect enormously, said, Janae, it just doesn't hang together. And so I took another look at the book and dang if she wasn't right. And so it went on my shelf. And some years later, I couldn't stop thinking about Annie Hawkins Green. So I pulled the book off the shelf, the manuscript off the shelf, and I read through it again, looking for anything that I could salvage. And I decided that Annie Hawkins Green was um, a character who needed to be salvaged, but she needed to be in a different book. So I was talking to Annie. I often talk to my characters and she said, well, I'm a photographer. And I said, great. I know photography. I can do this. And she said, no, I'm a war photographer. You're just a photojournalist. You don't even like to go into dangerous places, even though you do. So I made her a war photographer and therefore I needed a war. Uh, and so I cast around looking for some sort of conflict zone. And I wanted a, a war in which the US had a military presence because I wanted Annie in the first chapter to be embedded um, with the U.S. military and the coalition forces in wherever. And so Afghanistan came onto the picture. And I have um, long loved the literature coming out of Afghanistan, the uh, poetry. Um, I just, I love Afghan culture. And I love the complexity of life in Afghanistan and the hospitality and warmth of the Afghan people. And so Afghanistan it was. And um, before people think that this is a war book, it's really not. Um, there are There is a, a war scene at the beginning of Behind the Lens and a war scene at the end. And in double exposure, um, there is not really any war scene, although there um, are some dangerous things that happen near the end of the book. Yeah, but what's interesting is you really did write this into an entirely different culture. I mean, you must have done so much research because you're talking about multiple cultures within Africa. 
Afghanistan, not one culture, multiple languages. And you really, I, I could tell, right, as I'm reading the book, I'm like, wow, the research that this took, the meticulous research that this took to do justice to that culture or many cultures and languages. How did you even approach that as you realized that that was where this book belonged? Well, the very first thing I did after I got the concept, I met with a Muslim community in South Milwaukee. And um, there were five couples, including the imam and his wife. And I just pitched them the idea. And they were rather stunned that someone would do this up front. But I said, you know, I am not Muslim. I want to know if this is even going to work. And they loved the idea. Um, and so that was where I started. And they gave me so much help. They gave me a huge stack of material as well as a Quran, which I dutifully read. And they gave me some really important advice. And they said, you have to realize that there is a difference between um, the culture of Iran and Islam and what the Taliban and now ISIS also are trying to impose on the Afghan people and how they are interpreting Islam. And that was my mantra throughout writing the book. I also did a huge amount of research. Um, I discovered the internet is my best friend so long as you quadruple, quintuple, check everything and then check it again. And even if you think you know something, um, check it, check it, check it. For example, my uh, second book, Double Exposure, is set in um, Milwaukee, Shorewood, and Bayview, which I know very well. And I triple-checked everything, and I ran it by people. Um, in addition, my brother is um, now retired naval officer, and he was incredible incredibly helpful with all things uh, naval and military. And he even got me on board a ship of the same type as the USS Bataan. So I could have really firsthand uh, knowledge of what Annie was seeing when she was and feeling uh, when she was on that ship. I also in my writing group, I have a lawyer who in double exposure, there are some law scenes and she and her husband, who's also a lawyer, helped enormously with that. My husband is a physician. And so in book in double exposure, where there are medical scenes, he was very helpful with that. But when I was getting ready to publish behind the lens, it occurred to me that it would be very helpful to have a cultural <laughs> sensitivity reader. And I made my way through some connections to MPAC, which is the Muslim um, Public Advisory Council. And they were incredible. Um, I actually got in touch with the Hollywood branch and they were in the middle of two crises because most people don't consult them until the movie or the television show is out there and there's a problem. And so again, they were thrilled that I was taking it from the front end and asking to um, have someone read through the book and make sure it's an accurate portrayal of life in Afghanistan and um, Islam. And um, so my cultural and sensitivity reader is a fabulous woman named Heba el Kobaitri, And she read both books with a fine tooth comb. And we talked about anything that she felt was incorrect. And in fact, um, I did some revisions, but one entire chapter um, got revised un under her tutelage. And for that, I am incredibly grateful. In Double Exposure, she took issue with a scene at the very end, and I don't want to do any. Um, yes, no spoilers. 
but she suggested that I rewrite a scene from Seema's point of view and um, as Annie's observing her, but Seema is the, um, has agency in that scene. And she was absolutely right. And there's a beautiful quote from, from the person you're talking about on, on your book. I'll just read a little of this where she describes it as an intense read that focuses on the inner strength of women, the power of profound friendships, the love that aids survival during the hardest moments in life and appreciation for one another, despite culture, and religious divides and I thought that was lovely that that your your educated beta reader was able to say that like this book portrays friendship across divides which is one of the beautiful things to me about it it's you've got this incredibly strong badass character right I mean there, there's no other way to describe Annie Hawkins Green who is like charging into war war zones as a photojournalist but she's dealing with her own trauma she's got a teenage daughter she is trying to work out romance and how you can even have a romantic angle in your life when that's what your life works looks like is putting yourself at risk every day. Not to mention, how can you be a mom when you're dealing with that? And mm -hmm. she's dealing with her own past trauma and PTSD from some really horrific things that she's seen in her past. And so you bundle all of this into this character and it's like she's fighting battles on so many different levels, right? How do I battle to be a good mom? How do I battle to have romance in my life? How do I manage through that relationship? And how do I build these friendships, right? With these Muslim women in this country that I am a guest in. And I just thought you you managed to, to kind of balance and portray all of that so well in a way that kept you really gripped and, and like gripped on every page. I wanted to know what was gonna happen. Thank you so much. You really got it. I really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, Annie has a very close friendship and a lot of people talk about her um, romance with Sorelli in both books, but um, for me, the primary relationship, certainly in Behind the Lens, is her close, intense friendship with her former college roommate and best friend, Daria Faludi. And that to me is the love story that takes front and center place in Behind the Lens. And then in Double Exposure, she becomes very close friends with um, Gulshan, who is the English teacher at the Wadkal School for Girls. So I'm interested in if someone hasn't read either book, would you recommend they read them in order? I mean, I actually... And I think I got like a page in and I said, oh my goodness, this is so good. I got to go read the first one first. Um, so like, would you recommend people read them in order? It doesn't matter if you like romance more, start with double exposure. Like what, what are you recommending to people? Well, um, I just saw a TikTok on Instagram about my book and which I, and it's such a great TikTok. And it starts with the woman leaning into the camera and said, it's a rule. You don't have to read a series in order. And she had read Double Exposure first and then was going back to Behind the Lens. One of the things I'm trying to do in this series, which most series writers don't do, most series writers, if there is a romantic through line, they will follow that through the entire series. But then each individual book, as far as the rest of the storyline, is a standalone. And in my book, what at my series, what I'm doing is each book can stand alone, but there are also through lines that carry through the entire series. I'm really interested in this community aspect of like, what have you learned from the writing community and what advice do you give to other writers who might be trying to take something on that's just this difficult? Uh, the number one piece of advice I give to every writer starting out um, is read in the genre that you want to be writing in. Um, there are, I used to be the leader of a roundtable critique group. And there would be people who would come in with a wonderful short story or a novel or a YA or whatever. And my first question was, do you read short stories? 
Do you read YA? I think you better start there. You really need to know the expectations of the genres so that as Annie says in her photography workshop and behind the lens, you know the rules well enough that you can break them, that you don't need to think about them anymore and you can break them. Um, but also you need to know where your book is gonna sit on the shelf in a, a physical bookstore or how Amazon is going to um, sell it. And however much we all love writing, it's a business and any bookstore, any publisher, Amazon wants to be able to sell it and they need to know how to sell it. And so read in the genre. So is there a gutsy badass woman shelf in the bookstore? <laughs> uh, that's my favorite kind of character. I love badass women. Um, I love women who are complex, who um, are not the good girl who um, does the right thing, who are flawed characters. They're just so much more interesting. They have something to say. We asked about advice. What about reading? Have you read anything that you would recommend to our listeners? Yeah, I have. Um, I absolutely am haunted by Deborah Thomas's novel, Luz. Um, L-U-Z. I think it is so truthful. It is about um, another culture and it's just lovely. I also very much like what Maggie Smith does in Truth and Other Lies, how she um, portrays the challenges that journalists, especially print journalists, face. Um, and we I had, um, we had Maggie Smith on the podcast, so I'll put the link to her episode on the episode okay. page as well. Great. Um, I also am a huge series reader. And the most recent book I read in any series is Anna Lee Huber's A Wicked Conceit, which is a fabulous historical um, mystery series set in mostly in Scotland. Um, in the 1830s. It is meticulously researched. Um, there is a whole social background to it that is just wonderful. And two other books, one book that really inspired me, well, two books, Pam Jenoff often says that her favorite books that she has written um, are um, Almost Home, and I'm blanking on the name of the second book, but it's a duo. And I think her work is phenomenal. And, the and we'll, put the, book, we'll put the name of both of those, of all of these, on the episode page at bestofwomensfiction.com so folks can find them as well. The last book that I have been reading recently, because it's part of my research, is I Am the Beggar of the World a collection of Landes from contemporary Afghanistan. And Landes are a two line, 22 syllable oral poems composed by um, Afghan women. Traditionally, um, it was Pashtun women who composed them. And um, they are oral because Pashtun women were never allowed to learn to read or write. It was considered dishonorable to the family. And even to this day, um, women who compose <clears throat> these um, landes, if their family discovers them, the family may um, do an honor killing. And one of the most prominent lande writers was in fact killed by her family in 2017 that recently. And um, <clears throat> these Alande actually in Pashto is also a very poisonous snake. And these um, brief poems can be beautiful love poems um, written for the beloved that a woman's family will never allow her to marry. And she sings it to him again, if she's caught, um, not good. Um, but they can also be 
toxic and snake-like and uh, very cutting. They, uh, in some ways, remind me of Emily Dickinson's poetry, that same really honed, gem-like uh, verse. And what I <clears throat> discovered Landais through pure serendipity when I was researching something about food in Afghanistan. And as soon as I discovered them, I said, these have to go in the book. And I use them in several ways. I use them as a plot device to reveal hidden relationships between some characters. But I also use it, um, even though it's traditionally women who write and sing these Landais, I have um, the Annie's love interest, uh, Captain Finn Sorelli, being an incredible Lande writer. And he pens these Landais or says them to Annie to move their relationship along. And that uh, was one of my favorite parts of the book, actually. Oh. I did not know what a Lande was, and I learned all about it from reading your two books. Wonderful. <laughs> I, um, anyway, so um, because I am working as we speak on book number three, I was once again reading I Am the Beggar of the World. Wonderful. And is there anything I haven't asked you before we wrap up that you love for folks to know about you or about your books? Well, uh, yes, about me. Um, I have a background in academia. I have a PhD in English. I directed a writing program at Rochester Institute of Technology for a number of years. And that gave me a profound commitment to education. Um, and my work in photography, um, traveling around the world, photographing women and children, uh, gave me an even more profound commitment to education of girls, especially in countries where that education is illegal. And that is really one of the cores of both of these books. Annie shares that commitment to education for girls, for um, the girls in Afghanistan, where a very large percentage of girls are still um, without education. And now that the Taliban have come back into power as of August 15th, 2021, um, girls will only be allowed at most to be educated through grade six. And uh, so a portion of the proceeds goes um, to various charitable organizations that promote the education of girls and women. Oh, good. Yeah, it's so sad. Um, so if folks want to follow you, learn more about these causes that are near and dear to you, maybe see some of your photography, where do you recommend? I think Instagram is where I love following you, but, uh, where do you hang out the most? Um, on Instagram and Facebook, um, Instagram is author Janae Sacken. Facebook is just Janae Sacken. And I also have a website, um, which is just my name, Janae and I have information about the books, but I also have galleries of my images from various beautiful, photo shoots. Beautiful work, beautiful work. I love your photography as well. Um, well, thank you so much for joining me today. And I encourage folks to go pick up either of these books in either order. I read them from, from the first to the second, but I agree that you don't have to. I think you could start with Double Exposure, especially if you like the romantic aspect of it, which is a little bit more in the second book. And yeah. so I definitely would encourage folks to pick up one or the other. They are beautiful, well-researched, gripping books. You won't be sorry. Thank you so much. It's been a thrill talking to you.